Prophecy of Future Blessing on Israel and Ezekiel In previous chapters of Ezekiel, prophecies were directed against Israel and revealed her future judgments because of her sin. These prophecies were confirmed because Jerusalem had now fallen to the Babylonians and had been destroyed. Because of the literal fulfillment of these prophecies, it gives credence to prophecies yet unfulfilled. In Ezekiel 25-32, judgments were pronounced on the various nations surrounding Israel. Many of these are yet subject to future fulfillment. Beginning with Ezekiel 33, the prophet predicted future blessing on Israel, some blessings to come relatively soon and others referring to the far distant restoration of Israel at the end of the Great Tribulation. Ezekiel commissioned as a watchman. Ezekiel 33, 1-20 Ezekiel was warned to deliver the message of judgment to Israel just as a watchman would announce the coming of an enemy. Accordingly, Ezekiel was charged to warn the wicked of their coming judgment. If he did not, he would be held accountable. God instructed Ezekiel to tell Israel that he did not take pleasure in judging them. He wanted them to turn from their evil ways. God will honor the wicked who turn to the Lord if they turn from their wickedness, and he will judge the righteous who turn from their righteousness to sin. In effect, God offered forgiveness to all those who would come to him in sincere repentance. Verse 13 through 16. If the Israelites blamed God, saying that he was not just, they would be judged for their sin. This was fulfilled in Ezekiel's lifetime. Report of Jerusalem's Fall Ezekiel 33, 21 and 22 Several months after Jerusalem fell in 586 BC, word of the city's destruction reached Ezekiel. Following this, the Lord who had been keeping Ezekiel somewhat silent opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened and I was no longer silent. Judgment pronounced on those who remain in the land. Ezekiel 33, 23-33 Those who remain in the land likened their possession of the land to Abraham possessing the land when he came from Ur of Chaldees. Genesis eleven thirty one, 31 Genesis 12, 1-5 God informed the people who were remaining in the land that their case was not the same as Abraham's because Abraham was a righteous man while they were still disobeying the law, worshiping idols, eating meat with blood, and committing immorality. Ezekiel 33, 23-26 God warned the people left in the land that they would perish by the sword, by wild animals, by plague, and they would experience the judgment of the Lord. Verse 27-29 God evaluated Ezekiel's ministry to them, indicating that the people heard what he had to say, but they did not practice what they heard. James 1, 22-25 This was fulfilled after the fall of Jerusalem. Israel's faithless shepherds contrasted with her future true shepherd. Ezekiel 34, 1-10 The Israelites had been led astray because they had false shepherds who did not care for them, but ruled them harshly and brutally. No one had attempted to find the sheep who were scattered. God declared that he was going to hold the shepherds accountable for their failure to tend to the sheep of Israel. This was fulfilled in the Babylonian captivity. God promised to rescue them in Israel's future restoration. Ezekiel 34, 11-16 God declared that he himself would search for his sheep and rescue them where they had been scattered. God promised, I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. This prediction of the future regathering of Israel from all over the world is still an unfulfilled commitment that will be fulfilled when the coming millennial kingdom begins. God will especially care for those who are weak or injured, will bring them to rich pastures, and will shepherd them with justice. This will be fulfilled in the millennium. Jeremiah 23, 5-8 Ezekiel 34, 17-31 God promised special care for those who were weak and who had been trampled by the stronger sheep. He will serve as a judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Central to God's plan of restoration for Israel will be the resurrection of David as a true shepherd who will serve as a prince under Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This places the fulfillment at the second coming when Old Testament saints will be resurrected. Daniel 12, 1-3 God also promised that this would be a time of peace when the wild beasts will not afflict them, when they will receive showers to water the land and trees will bear their fruit. Ezekiel 34, 
God also promised to keep them in safety, no longer allowing the nations to plunder them and would deliver them from famine. As a result of God's work and restoration of Israel, then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are people, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. This will be fulfilled in the millennium. Jeremiah 23, 5-8 Prophecy Against Edom Ezekiel 35, 1-15 The prophecy against Mount Seir predicted the destruction of the Edomites, descendants of Esau, who lived in that area. Though Ezekiel had predicted earlier the destruction of the Edomites, this prophecy apparently is representative of all the nations that opposed Israel who will be judged in the future. Ezekiel 25, 12-14 the Edomites seem to have participated with the Babylonians in the destruction of Jerusalem and the cruelty those in Jerusalem experienced. The long history of the animosity of the descendants of Esau against Israel called for the many prophecies in the Bible in addition to those mentioned by Ezekiel. Isaiah 34, 5-8, Isaiah 63, 1-4, Jeremiah 49, 17, Lamentations 4, 21, Amos 1, 11, Obadiah 8 and 10. Though the Edomites had rejoiced in the destruction of Jerusalem, their land in turn would be made desolate, Ezekiel 35, 1-9. God would fill their nation's mountains as well as her valleys and ravines with the slain. Her towns would be destroyed and never inhabited. Edom had rejoiced in the fall of both Israel, the ten tribes, and Judah, the two tribes, which had led to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. She then thought that she would be able to take possession of all twelve tribes of Israel, Instead, God was going to cause her devastation. Verse 11 through 15. Actually, Edom continued for another four centuries before she gradually disappeared from history. In God's time, the prophecies were literally fulfilled. The future restoration of Israel to her land. Ezekiel 36, 1 through 7. Just as the people of Edom and other nations had hounded Israel, destroyed her cities, and plundered them, so God promised he would destroy the nations, including Edom, who had done this to Israel. Ezekiel 36, 8-36 To Israel, however, God gave the wonderful promise of a restoration. She will be restored like a tree producing branches and fruit. God will increase the number of the house of Israel, and her cities will once again be inhabited and her ruins rebuilt. Even animals will be more plentiful and the land will become more fruitful. God not only promised that the children of Israel would walk on her ancient land and possess it, but also that nothing would deprive them of their children, referring to the fact that Israel would be permanently established in her land when her final restoration takes place. Amos 9.15 God declared that never again will the children of Israel be destroyed and suffer taunts from the nations. Ezekiel 36.13-15 God reminded the children of Israel, however, of their wickedness, and how they were judged and dispersed among the nations because they had sinned against him. God declared that the Israelites would be scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. God would not restore Israel because she deserved it, but because of his desire to show her his righteousness and his holiness. In her restoration, God would cleanse her and give her his Holy Spirit. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Verse 24 through 27. The Holy Spirit will indwell them in that day, in contrast to the Mosaic dispensation when only a few were indwelt. In that day when the Israelites again live in their promised land, they will belong to God, and God will be their God. God will make their grain plentiful, and they will no longer have famine. When God will prosper them in their day of restoration, they will think back to their wickedness and know that God has shown them His grace. The land is described as resettled, rebuilt, no longer desolate, but like the Garden of Eden, verse 33-35. This will be a testimony to the nations that God has restored Israel, verse 36. Most important, Israel will know that the Lord is her God and that he has restored her. 
This entire chapter requires a future millennial kingdom after the second coming of Christ for its complete and literal fulfillment, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8. Just as the prophecies of judgment were literally fulfilled in connection with Israel and the nations, so her future restoration will be literally fulfilled and she will experience the marvelous grace of God. Division of the dry bones, the restoration of Israel, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. Ezekiel was given a vision of a valley filled with dry bones. The Lord asked him the question, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel was cautious in replying, indicating that only the Lord would know. Ezekiel then was instructed to prophesy that these dry bones would come to life, that the bones would come together, that flesh would cover them, and finally, that they would have the breath of life, much like Adam. Genesis 2.7 then God spoke to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. Ezekiel 37, 9. When Ezekiel obeyed the Lord and prophesied, breath entered the bones, they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Verse 10. Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14. Having given Ezekiel the vision, the Lord now interpreted it for him. In the interpretation, Ezekiel was informed that the bones represented Israel. Her hopeless, dried condition illustrated her hopelessness of ever being restored. In response to this, God promised to bring her back from death and to the land of Israel. God would put his Holy Spirit in her and she would be settled in her own land. The Lord said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Verse 11 through 14. In biblical interpretation today, many affirm that Israel will never be restored. They share the hopelessness that gripped the Israelites as they were scattered from their land to Assyria and Babylon. Contradicting this hopeless situation, God promised to restore Israel in the strongest possible terms indicated that he would bring new life to her, and she would be restored as a nation that she would be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and she would settle in her own land in safety. The prediction that she would be brought up from the grave is partly symbolic that the nation seemed to be dead and will be restored to physical life. But it is also to be considered literally because according to Daniel 12, one through three, at the close of the great tribulation when Christ returns in his second coming, there will be a resurrection of Old Testament saints. Both figuratively and literally, Israel will be restored and given new life. Those who have died and were saved will be resurrected to share in the millennial kingdom as resurrected saints. The promise that his Holy Spirit would be in Israel goes beyond her experience under the law when the Holy Spirit was with her, but not necessarily in her. John 14, 17. Beginning on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, all genuinely saved people are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a situation that will continue until the rapture of the church. Though there is no clear revelation of what will be true between the rapture and the second coming, this and other scriptures make clear that the Holy Spirit will indwell the saints in the millennial kingdom. Ezekiel 37, 14, Jeremiah 31, 33. Sign of the two sticks. Ezekiel 37, 15 through 17. Ezekiel was commanded, son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, Ephraim's stick, belonging to Joseph and all the house of Israel associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. The situation being addressed was that of the divided kingdom. After Solomon, the ten tribes following Jeroboam became the king of Israel. The two remaining tribes in Jerusalem, Judah and Benjamin, became the kingdom of Judah. The ten tribes were carried off to Assyria in 722 B.C., and the two remaining tribes were carried off to Babylon between 605 and 586 BC. The situation where these two kingdoms were divided will end. And as this and other prophecies predict, 
the two kingdoms will become one nation. Jeremiah 3.18, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Jeremiah 30, verse 3, Hosea 1.11, Amos 9.11. No fulfillment has ever been recorded in history, and the future regathering of Israel will occur in the millennium. Ezekiel 37, 18 through 23. Ezekiel was instructed to answer the questions of those who asked the meaning of the two sticks, and he was to tell them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join them to Judah's stick, making them a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Verse 19. God then further interpreted this, saying, I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. God promised he would keep Israel from defiling herself as she had done in the past, and he declared, I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. This will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. Ezekiel 37, 24 and 25. As predicted in 34, verse 23 and 24, so here again the prophecy was given. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I give my servant Jacob, the land where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever, and David my servant will be their prince forever. Though some have attempted to take this prophecy in less than its literal meaning, the clear statement is that David, who is now dead and whose body is in his tomb in Jerusalem, Acts 2.29, will be resurrected. This will occur at the second coming, Daniel 12.1-3, indicating plainly that the restoration of Israel will be subsequent to, not before, the second coming. This requires Christ's coming before the millennium or in the fulfillment of the premillennial promises. The promise that David would be her prince forever must be interpreted as being fulfilled in the thousand-year reign. Actually, the word forever is a translation of an expression, to the ages, which may be interpreted as forever or until eternity begins. Ezekiel 37, 26-28 As Jeremiah stated, God predicted here a covenant of peace with Israel that will be an everlasting covenant. Though announced in the Old Testament, it will replace the Mosaic Covenant and will have its primary fulfillment for Israel at the time of the Second Coming, when Israel is restored nationally and spiritually. Scholars have puzzled over the precise meaning of the New Covenant, earlier announced by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Probably the simplest explanation is that in the dying on the cross, God made possible a covenant of grace for those who would trust the Lord. This covenant of grace is the basis for the salvation of every individual, from the time of Adam to the last person who is saved. It is preeminently illustrated in the present age when God saves the church by grace and the Lord's Supper commemorates the new covenant. The new covenant as applied here to Israel primarily has a prophetic meaning, which is indicated here as being fulfilled in the peace, righteousness, and restoration that will characterize the millennial kingdom. At the time of the fulfillment of this covenant, the number of Israelites in the land will increase greatly, especially during the millennial kingdom. A preliminary prophecy that God will provide a sanctuary referred to a millennial temple that will be described later in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. God promised to be with Israel and dwell among her in the millennial kingdom, verse 27. This will also be true in the new earth and eternity. The restoration of Israel will be assigned to the world so that the nations will know that it will be accomplished by the Holy Lord, who is able to cleanse Israel and make her holy prophecy against Gog. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 39, verse 24. Included in the section dealing with Israel's blessing is the description of the deliverance of Israel from the northern invaders led by Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The prophecy against Gog is one of the most dramatic predictions in Ezekiel. Many details of the prophecy are not entirely clear, but the main thrust of the prediction is not difficult to understand. The passage predicts an invasion of Israel by a great army that will attack Israel from the north. In order to understand this prophecy, some background in the prophetic foreview of the end of the age is necessary. 
This passage is a part of the predictions of the great world conflict that will characterize the years just before the second coming. Though Bible expositors have differed as to when this fits into the prophetic picture, it is plausible that preceding this event, the predictions of the revived Roman Empire, a ten-nation confederacy, will be fulfilled. This will be considered in the prophecies of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. A political leader will arise who will head up the ten nations and make the Mediterranean Sea a Roman lake as it was in the New Testament times. He was referred to in Daniel 9.26 as the ruler who will come. This ruler will be associated with the people who destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, that is, the Roman people, and accordingly, he will fulfill the role of a Roman leader in the end time by heading up this ten-nation confederacy. This ruler will be featured in the first of three major phases of prophetic fulfillment, climaxing in the second coming of Christ. His rise and the formation of the ten-nation confederacy will set the stage for what will follow. The second phase of this struggle with a duration of three and a half years was described by Ezekiel in these two chapters. Though variously interpreted, it may be the forerunner and major event that leads up to the world event government predicted for the last three and a half years leading up to the second coming. As the battle described here is a disaster for the invading countries, it may change the political power structure to such an extent that it will be possible for the Roman leader of the ten nations to become a world dictator. The third phase of the period leading up to the second coming will be this world empire stage, including all nations of the world. Daniel 7.23, Revelation 13.7 and 8. The third phase, ending in the second coming, will be a time of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation also records another mammoth world war. Daniel 11, 40-45, Revelation 16, 12-16, which will occur just before the second coming. This should be distinguished from the war described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is not a world conflict, but a war between a select group of nations. In the years since World War II, Russia has risen to be one of the great military powers of the modern world. To a far greater extent than ever before, Russia is a prominent nation, especially in its influence on the Middle East. The possibility of Russia attacking Israel is a modern concern of the United States and other nations. With both Russia and China constituting a major political bloc, a future war between Russia and Israel becomes a possibility. The word Russia never occurs in scripture, but the description of this war connects these two important chapters of Ezekiel with the future outcome of Russia as a world power. If Ezekiel 38 and 39 is studied carefully, it reveals a future invasion of the land of Israel by the armies of Russia and five other nations. Though sometimes confused with the Battle of Armageddon, which will be a world conflict before the second coming, this war will be distinct in its objectives, its character, and its outcome. According to scripture, the invaders will be totally destroyed. Undoubtedly, this will have an effect on the world power struggle in which Russia now is a major factor. As this prophecy was written over 2,500 years ago, the question remains whether this has ever been fulfilled in the past. A search of history finds no such battle or outcome. Accordingly, as illustrated in countless other passages, prophecy that has not been fulfilled is subject to future fulfillment, just as literally as the prophecies were fulfilled in the past. Though it may leave some questions unanswered, the study of these two chapters supplies an important segment of prophecy as it relates to the end time period leading up to the second coming of Christ. The point of view adopted here places this war in the first half of the last seven years, probably towards its close. Other views have been advanced that should be compared to this interpretation. If you have advanced the theory that this war must occur before the rapture, the situation described here does not come to pass until after the rapture. The scene is one of peace that has its best explanation with the seven-year covenant enacted by the ruler of the ten-nation confederacy. This can only occur after the restraint of the presence of the Holy Spirit has been removed at the rapture. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6-8 Further, it would contradict the doctrine of the imminency of the rapture. Another view combines the war with Russia with the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, 13 through 16. The war centering in Armageddon is one that involves all the nations of the world. The Russian war is predominantly Russia with its allies. The Armageddon struggle covers all the Holy Land, but the war with Russia is settled on the northern mountain of Israel. Armageddon is the climax of the Great Tribulation. A time of persecution for Israel. Ezekiel 38 describes Israel at peace and in prosperity. For these reasons, Ezekiel 38 and 39 does not fit Armageddon.
Some have suggested that the war will take place at the beginning of the millennium. This will be a time of peace that will follow the second coming. But all the unsaved are executed in the judgments at the second coming, and believers in Christ would not support a war against Israel and Jerusalem. Still another suggestion is that it will occur at the end of the millennium. The fact that Gog and Magog are mentioned both in Ezekiel 38.2 and in Revelation 20 verse 8 indicates to some a connection. However, Gog is a human leader and Magog are a people in Ezekiel 38, but their meaning is not defined in Revelation 20. In other respects, this scene is different. In Ezekiel, life goes on after the war, requiring months to bury the dead. The war in Revelation 20 is followed immediately by the destruction of the earth and the creation of the new heaven and new earth. The war in Revelation 20 concerns Jerusalem. The war in Ezekiel does not touch Jerusalem. The scenes are different. Ezekiel 38, 1-6 In the opening portion of this great prophecy, six nations are mentioned, the most important of which had a leader called Gog, identified as a ruler of Magog. He was further described as the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. The leader described as Gog apparently will lead a force from the land of Magog. Magog was mentioned in Genesis 10 verse 2 as one of the sons of Japheth, a fact repeated in 1 Chronicles 1 5. In addition to the two references in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Magog is also mentioned in Revelation 20 verse 8, where it seems to refer to a totally different situation. The most plausible explanation is that Gog is the ruler and Magog are the people. In the description of Gog as the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, the American Standard Version translates this expression, the prince of Rosh, which some connect with the poor consonants of the modern term Russia. They were an ancient people located to the north of Israel. Ezekiel 27 verse 13, Ezekiel 32 verse 26. Tubal, chapter 38 verse 2, is also mentioned as a son of Japheth. Genesis 10 verse 2, 1 Chronicles 1 5. Though originally located south of the Holy Land area, the people of Tubal eventually went north and have been identified as the ancient Scythian tribe, which at one time occupied Asia Minor. The leading thought on these identifications is that it verifies that the invaders come from the north of Israel. The prediction pictured God as putting hooks in the jaws of Gog and leading him and his army from the north against Israel. Ezekiel 38.4 Persia verse 5 has been easily identified as related to modern Iran, which could easily supply an army attacking Israel from the north, even though located to the east. The identity of Cush, verse 5, is uncertain but it has often been referred to as the area east of Egypt and west of the Red Sea. This would require them to go around, possibly by sea, to join the army from the north attacking Israel. The identity of Put also is uncertain, but some have placed it immediately south of Cush in Africa. Gomer, verse 6, was usually associated with the ancient Sumerians, some who were located in Asia Minor and others in Eastern Europe. Beth Tagarma has been identified with Armenia, located to the north of Israel. Though all the nations were not located to the north of Israel, it is not too difficult to understand their participation in the major invasion of the north dominated by Russia. Some also point to the fact that Meshech has some similarity to the modern name of Moscow in its consonant structure, and Tubal is similar to one of the prominent provinces of Russia, Tobolsk, T-O-B-O-L-S-K. When all the facts are put together, it indicates that linguistically, geographically, and theologically, the identity of the invading nations is sufficiently clear to identify them as a great force coming from the north. Probably the most convincing explanation is the fact that the invaders, especially Gomer and Magog, invade the land from far north. The only nation that the description far north would fit would be Russia, which, of course, is to the north of Israel, with Moscow being directly north of Jerusalem. Though some attempt to question the identification because Russia extends more than 6,000 miles east and west, any reference to a nation to the far north of Israel would have to be Russia because of the geographic facts involved. As early as 38 verse 4, the prophecy reveals that the army will come mounted on horses with the horsemen fully armed. The horsemen are armed with shields and swords and helmets, with additional weapons including bows and arrows and war clubs and spears. 39 verse 9. Much speculation has arisen from the fact that these are ancient weapons contemporary with Ezekiel, but not describing modern warfare. 
Some regard these ancient weapons as simply typical or figurative of modern warfare. Others attempt to explain these weapons on the basis that they are quickly and readily made and possibly may be used in the period where other weapons have been subject to disarmament. The final answer to explain the weapons is unknown. Ezekiel 38, 7-9 The army is described as a great horde that will invade a land that has been restored from previous desolation. The people are described as those who have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were further described as coming from the nations and living in safety. The attack, therefore, was unexpected and was imposed on a people who were not prepared militarily to defend themselves. The invaders were described as so great in number that they looked like a cloud covering the land. Verse 9, Ezekiel 38, 10-13 The invaders are quoted as saying, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. Verse 11. The scene described is a modern scene where walls are no longer necessary to protect a village, confirming the idea that it is an unexpected attack. The people of Israel in the land are described as a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. The people of Israel are described as living in the resettled ruins, and they are described as gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish ask the question whether they have come to seize plunder. Sheba probably refers to the kingdom from which the queen of Sheba had come to see Solomon, 1 Kings 10, 1-13, 2 Chronicles 9, 1-12. It was located in southwestern Arabia, mentioned by Isaiah, Isaiah 21, 13, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, 23, Jeremiah 49, 8, and Ezekiel, Ezekiel 25, 13, Ezekiel 27, 15, and 20, Ezekiel 38, 13, and probably referred to a tribe that had intermarried with the Cushite people. Tarshish was probably related to an area where oil was collected in Spain, though some identify it also as a location in southern Arabia where ore was also smelted. In a word, these were merchants who were acquainted with the wealth of Israel. Ezekiel 38, 14-16 Ezekiel was instructed to prophesy that this event would take place. Israel is described as living in safety, verse 14, and their safety is mentioned also in verse 8 and 39, verse 6. This reference should make clear that it is not describing Israel today, which is an armed camp and living in fear of its neighbors. The nature of the attack is summarized by God. You will come from your place in the far north you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, O Gog, I will bring you against my lands, so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. Ezekiel 38, 15 and 16. These verses summarize what was said earlier in the chapter, that the attack will come when Israel will be living in safety that the invaders will come from the far north, that they will be riding on horses, that they will be numerous like a cloud, and that God will bring them against the people of Israel so that by their destruction, he can show his own holiness and power. Ezekiel 38, 17 through 23. God reminded the invaders of what was predicted in former days by his servants, the prophets of Israel. The specifics of this prophecy had not been previously mentioned. But many chapters in the prophets deal with the nations around Israel and God bringing judgment upon them. Accordingly, what was about to be revealed is in keeping with God's previous prophecies. God declared his reaction to the attack against Israel. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declared that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Verse 18 and 19. The remarkable aspect of this prophecy is that the scriptures do not reveal any opposing army attacking the invaders. Rather, it will be a time when God himself by supernatural actions destroy the army. The first step will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The effect of this earthquake will be felt by all of God's creatures on earth. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. Verse 20. The second great judgment that God will bring on the invaders will be that they will fight among themselves. 
I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Verse 21. Because of the disruption brought about by the earthquake and the fact that the army will be composed of various peoples coming from various nations, it is easy to understand how through misunderstanding they can start fighting among themselves, thinking that the others are a defending people. The next form of judgment will be by plague and bloodshed. Verse 22. In addition to their being destroyed by the sword, they will experience a plague, a means God has often used to attack the enemies of Israel. Isaiah 37, 36. The following judgment speaks of torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. Ezekiel 38, 22. The floods caused by torrents of rain would obviously hinder an invading army and cause more confusion in communications, which would probably account for the fact that they will be fighting one another. The hailstones also being supernatural may be destructive of human life. The burning sulfur that will fall on them will be a reminder of how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The nature of these judgments demonstrates to all that God will fight the invading army and pour his judgment on them. This is brought out in the closing verse of the chapter. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Verse 23. Ezekiel 39, 1-6. through six. In repeating aspects of the prophecy of invaders' destruction, God noted again that the invasion of the land will be caused by his bringing them into this conflict. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you from the far north and send you against the mountains of Israel. The geographic origination of the invasion is again said to be the far north. God further declared, Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. Earlier, he had mentioned other weapons, but this passage for the first time mentions bows and arrows, which were standard weapons in the time Ezekiel lived. Though bows and arrows are usually characterized as primitive weapons, they actually have played a part in modern warfare and were used extensively, for instance, in the war in Vietnam. Because an arrow going through the air does not give away the location of the one who shot the arrow, it therefore was good for use in jungle situations. No final answer can be given why primitive weapons are specified. Though the outcome of the battle was clearly prophesied, Scripture does not offer any explanation why the weapons described are primitive. Because of the various judgments of God mentioned earlier, he declared that the invading army will fall on the mountains of Israel. Verse 4. God stated, I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall on the open field, for I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. From these scriptures, it is clear that the entire invading army will be wiped out. In the King James Version, Ezekiel 39 verse 2 was translated, And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. This translation is inaccurate, and from the New International Version it is clear that the entire invading force will be wiped out as indicated in the expression, All your troops and the nations with you. In addition to wiping out the army that will invade Israel, a judgment of fire will also be inflicted on Magog and those who live in safety in the coastlands, indicating that a special judgment will be visited also on the land from which the Russian army troops come. Ezekiel 39, 7 and 8 The purpose of the destruction of the armies will be to give notice to the nations that they will no longer be able to profane the holy name of the Lord. Verse 7 God reaffirms the certainty and literalness of this event, declaring, It is coming. It will surely take place. Verse 8 Ezekiel 39, 9 and 10. The extent of the destruction is indicated by the amount of weapons that will be accumulated from the victory over the invading army. They will be used for fuel and include the small and large shields, the bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears. For seven years, they will use them for fuel. They will not need to gather wood from the fields or cut it from the forest because they will use the weapons for fuel. And they will plunder those who plundered them and loot those who looted them, declares the sovereign Lord. The theory that these weapons are simply figurative and not representing real weapons of wood is countered by the fact that they will be used for fuel, indicating that the weapons will actually be as described. Also, the fuel will be of such a large amount that they will be able to fuel their fires for seven years. The figure of seven years introduces some problems as it affects the location of this war in the end time events because it pictures Israel at peace and in safety, 38 verse 8, 39 verse 6. The burning of the fuel is not a prophetic event, 
but only a statement of the amount of debris. A number of expositors have located this war in the first half of the last seven years leading up to the second coming. The first half of the seven years will be a period of peace because of the covenant entered into between Israel and the Gentile ruler of that period, Daniel 9.27. The problem of the fuel lasting seven years, however, is not a real prophetic problem because even after the Lord returns, they will still need fuel for fires in the millennial kingdom as life goes on. Accordingly, the seven-year figure should not be considered an obstacle to placing the war somewhere in the middle of the last seven years with the possibility that it may occur earlier in the seven-year period and justify the approximate figure of seven years. Ezekiel 39, 11-16 The thousands of soldiers killed in the war are described as requiring seven months to bury them in order to cleanse the land. Verse 11-13 After the seven months, there will still be other bodies located. And according to the prophecy, some people will be permanently employed to search out the dead and bury them. Ezekiel 39, 17-20 Immediately after the battle, before the burial takes place, God will invite the birds and wild animals to feast on the dead bodies. God pointed out how the dead will include riders, some of whom were important people, and also their horses. Verse 17-20 Ezekiel 39, 21-24 the judgment on the invaders is designed to display the power of God. God had previously judged the people of Israel because of their unfaithfulness, and many of them had died. The Restoration of Israel Ezekiel 39, 25-29 In this section, God announced the restoration of Israel as was predicted in many other passages in the Old Testament. God declared, I will now bring Jacob back from captivity and will have compassion on all the people of Israel, and I will be zealous for my holy name. They will forget their shame and all the unfaithfulness they showed toward me when they lived in safety in their land with no one to make them afraid. This prediction of restoration is just as literal as the prediction of the battle, and both will take place in the future. God, having previously predicted his judgments on Israel, here made a special point of how they will be gathered completely from the various foreign lands from which they were scattered. This was described in Ezekiel 38. Now God makes a specific and sweeping prediction. When I have brought them back from the nations and have gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will show myself holy through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. For though I sent them into exile among the nations, I will gather them to their own land, not leaving any behind. I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel declares the Sovereign Lord. Ezekiel 39, 27-29 Not only will God restore Israel to the land, but He also promised to gather all of His people from their scattered positions and bring them back to the land. This will occur in the opening period of the Millennial Kingdom. It will not be an option to the children of Israel, but they will be commanded to come to their promised land. This is a sweeping and dramatic prediction and it supports the doctrine of a glorious future for Israel in the millennium. Earlier in Ezekiel 20, verse 33 to 38, God had declared his purpose to regather Israel, but will purge the rebels or the unsaved so that only righteous Israel will be allowed to possess her ancient land. An important point in biblical interpretation is to treat these prophecies in the literal sense as are the other prophecies that have been fulfilled. If so, it requires the second coming of Christ to be before the thousand-year reign of Christ or the premillennial return of the Lord.